Columbus youth get a new path in life by learning construction skills in Franklinton. A profile of Florence Kenyon Hayden Rector, who helped build Madison Square Garden and Oxley Hall on OSU's campus. Chicken and waffles help former inmates and the homeless gain employment. And travel back to prehistory to discover innovation and artifacts. That's Columbus Neighborhoods, next, so stay tuned. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance and for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Moortime Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. Today we're talking about innovation. Our first story is about Franklinton Rising, a nonprofit that pairs local youth with broken down houses. Mentors teach construction skills and Franklinton gets homes ready for families. It's a multi-level approach to building up neighborhoods and building up young people who need a helping hand. You, you are putting in all this effort into something you, physical, tangible. You can look at it, you can touch it, and then at the end of the day, you get to walk back and see what you've worked on. Even if it's something as simple as just a wall, it's like now there's a wall there. Oh, yeah. And then day by day, you start to see a house come together, and, and then all the labor that comes with it. There's something really satisfying about putting all this time into something and seeing it come together and you can go and walk in and look at it. And you can point out, I did that, I did that. Well, I've been with Franklin and Rising, not quite two years, but almost. Franklin and Rising is a nonprofit organization, a training organization for young at-risk adults to help them prepare for a career in the building trades and we are a rebuilder of old homes. Uh, we turn otherwise tear down properties into brand new homes. And we use those houses as a training laboratory as for training our young adults. We really don't have any very many requirements for a young adult who wants to get into the program. And that means a three or four hour class one day a week. So they're learning things about um, tools, both hand tools, power tools, learning about construction math, uh, how to read blueprints. Through that IB. But if they don't attend the classes, they can't work. A real uh, meat and potatoes of it is when you finally get to work on one of these houses and then you actually start to learn. A lot of the stuff we learn in the house is the, the, they can learn at any job site, really. It's nothing really special, but we're trying to help them more. Responsibility, honesty, um, being on time, things like that, and just a good work ethic. And I'm like, cause they, is, if they're willing to invest in themselves, they can learn anything. Kind of learning how to do things for, and kind of advocate for yourself a bit more. To see some of these kids who we're the most stable thing in their lives in many cases. Our long-term goal is we'd like to get to a stage that we can put 10 trainees into the workforce each year. 
do the houses, we can't do them by ourselves. So I do want to, to recognize we have a lot of partners, companies that are working with us, organizations that are helping to make this possible. We realize that accountability, help but accountability, is what's really needed. Here's an opportunity. The kids are here. And the houses are already here. If we can help individuals understand that by hard work, by being supportive, by being a friend, by being a team player, by working hard, you can advance yourself and we can encourage that. It's very rewarding. You know, they don't ask a whole lot of you at the start, but they, they just want you to, you know, stick with the program and kind of be ready to learn and, uh, you know, work hard. And you, I don't know, you really get something out of it. it, it you, something tangible. You built a house. Next, Florence Kenyon Hayden Rector was one of the first female architects in the state of Ohio. Then a business plan that includes employment for former inmates. And find out how native people used copper in a unique way. Pop quiz, who helped design the seating plan for Madison Square Garden? The answer is one of the first female architects practicing in the state of Ohio. Her name was Florence Kenyon Hayden Rector and her innovation was a timely use of an office door. Check it out. Florence Kenyon Hayden Rector, or Kenyon Hayden Rector as she often referred to herself, was one of Ohio's pioneer architects and part of that first generation of women practicing architecture in the late 19th, early 20th century. She was one of three women who were enrolled at the Ohio State University School of Architecture in 1901 and that was shortly after the program was established. There were a lot of women artists. There weren't as many women architects because a lot of people really didn't think women could do the engineering or understand the complexity of building and, and structures and actually to get something built. So I think all of those things, she clearly was talented. She never finished architecture school. She never had a degree, and yet she had enough ability to actually design buildings and see them built. Well, Oxley Hall, originally known as the Women's Dormitory, this was Kenyon Hayden Rector's first major commission, and she was only 24 years old. She was recommended by Joseph Bradford, who was the university architect at the time, who was familiar with her work. She submitted plans, the Board of Trustees approved her preliminary plans, but they stipulated that she should work with a male architect and that was Wilbur T. Mills, who is most famously known as the architect of the Columbus Main Library on Grant Street. Basically, it was a marriage of convenience. It wasn't something that she wanted or felt that she needed. As she recalls in an interview later in her life, she had become very frustrated working with Mills on finishing up some plans. And actually, her day books support this information. She often had to meet with the Board of Trustees or the Building Committee by herself because Mills was out of town or Mills was not available or not present. And then on June 30th, 1907, her day book entry is spent all day correcting Mills specs. The next day's entry says fight with Mills. In the morning. We've got to do this in the morning. Tonight, but what should I do tonight? Think about it. At the end of the entry, it just says, dead. <laughs> she was frustrated by having that supervision and the idea that she couldn't design this building on her own. And at one point, she actually locked Mills out of her office so she could continue to work and get the design done. <laughs> Hey.
I think it says to me that she didn't just settle, she could do it better than the men. I'm impressed by a woman of that age, at that period of time, being able to design a building at Ohio State. So the plans were approved in August of 1907. The building opened in 1908 and was the first residence hall for women on the OSU campus. She was the only woman architect working in Columbus in the early 20th century, and many of her projects were residences, houses. She designed houses on East Broad Street, on Hawthorne Park. She was commissioned to do a bungalow at Buckeye Lake for Robert Wolfe, who's affiliated with the Ohio State Journal and Columbus Dispatch. When she married James Rector, who was a local physician, she designed his medical building. And this building, sadly, is no longer standing. It was at the corner of State and Sixth Street, but it was considered really a model in efficiency in medical office designs. I think she was a modern woman, and her designs look very 20th century. Even though they were designed in the early 20th century, it was a period of time when people were starting to think of homes as domestic science. It was when women became the people who managed homes, complicated homes. And I think her homes reflect that knowledge and that personal knowledge as a woman, a mother, a wife, and an architect. She was involved, along with her sister, Gillette, in the modern suffragette movement. They were both involved in the national women's movement and the idea of getting the 19th Amendment to the Constitution passed to give women the vote. In 1920, she wrote a publication called Women Awake, recounting the history of the women's suffragette movement and then putting out a final call to action for women to still step up to the plate and make sure that the 19th century amendment was actually ratified. Throughout her life was very committed to several causes, not just the suffragette movement, children's issues, prison reform, and improving women's working conditions. I think she'd easily still be a role model today. She made history happen. She broke down barriers in a male-dominated profession of architecture, and she was very passionate about a number of early 20th century reform issues. So, <laughs> what a woman! <laughs>
for us, like fried chicken is, is simple food. And so we don't want to overcomplicate it with too many variations, too many side dishes. We want to serve great food uh, that you can share with people you care about or share with strangers you meet when you're sitting at one of these long tables. So your business model kind of has a social justice uh, platform, if you would, yeah. uh, to it. Who do you hire and, and, and yeah. why? So we have, a, we have a very intentional strategy as an employer to provide uh, work opportunities to men and women that have been affected by incarceration uh, in the past. We call this fair chance employment. Uh, it works out that 60 or 70 percent of our team members are men and women that are getting back on their feet and kind of establishing a future story for themselves. Uh, and we get the privilege of being alongside of that. Now, I read somewhere about your business, about how you go about um, your everyday yeah. doings in the, in the company is that you are concerned about people's future and not harping on their past. That's very for your, true. For your company. Yeah, you know, when you, when you start to unpack the circumstance that leads many people to, to get one of these alternative resumes, which is internally how we refer to a criminal record often, you realize that these are, these are not uh, men and women void of integrity. It's not about character, but rather the circumstance associated with their environment, their neighborhood, their community, that has, has gone down a path um, that has assembled this alternative resume. And so we're really proud that we have a high integrity team that work incredibly hard for us, that perform better than most others in our industry. And it's, uh, it's kind of the bedrock and the foundation of our business's success too. So you've got flexible scheduling, you've got counseling, what about the profit? What about the bottom line? Uh, how, yeah. do you, how do you make that happen? We're able to run a really healthy business operation because our team is incredibly reliable, efficient, and productive, you know? And, and so when you talk to a lot of employers in our category, those are not adjectives they often use to describe their workforce. And so we believe our business is strong because our people are strong. Um, in terms of those benefits, you know, thinking about supporting somebody through a match savings program or a cash advance system or um, mental health counseling or you know support in any of these the reality is there's a, a pretty significant return for that um, uh, if somebody has adequate transportation the likelihood they're coming to work on time a lot higher um, uh, there are a lot of instances like that where we actually believe we're making not just investments in our employees but really an investment in ourselves as a company so was this just sort of put into your spirit to do something like this or was this a uh something you had saw somewhere else or thought yeah. about over the years? How did this happen? So I've been doing this work now for about 10 years in a variety of different settings. Hot, Hot Chicken Takeover has been running for about four years. This is, of course, a, a pretty successful application of the model. Uh, but there are others doing this. Um, and for me, I, I, I became passionate about this as kind of a combination of really loving entrepreneurship and building businesses, and also um, really, really having a lot of volunteerism kind of as a a, a fabric through my life and this became kind of an intersection to do it sustainably and really efficiently and um, to do both. You started kind of small and yeah. you grew, now you're expanding. What have been some of the challenges in ex expanding yeah. the business? O over the course of the last 12 months our business has uh, quadrupled in terms of team size and um, probably grew our operating hours by about five times. So a lot of growing pains associated with that. We went from one restaurant to three restaurants in about six months. Um, and so I, I think what we've realized is culture is kind of the, the bedrock uh, of hot chicken success and the way we treat our employees, the way we treat our customers. Many of those things over the course of this kind of growth, we had to really start thinking about how do we train people, whether it's training managers or training crew members, how do we train people to honor what makes this so special? Uh, and that's something I think easy to take for granted when you're running a more isolated operation. And so much of our growing pains were trying to keep up with how do we get more people on board quickly to do the best of what we do. So now, um, we've got some um, banana pudding here, which is one of my favorites. And um, before we taste test this, my mother-in-law makes a mean banana pudding. So I'm gonna taste test this and see if this can if you can give her if a I can rival. Yeah. Well, you yeah. just hold your reaction until the cameras go down. Okay. So then that way, she won't know. <laughs> okay, we'll see. That's good. We'll see. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Belong, for this time, and we, we wish you a lot of luck. Mm.
In ancient times, copper was so rare that it became a symbol of social status. In this From the Vault story, Brent Davis finds out how craftsmen use the rare metal in new ways. Brad, you've got two items on the table here. They must be connected, but I'm not sure how. Well, they may not look similar, but this is raw copper of the sort that folks would have been mining and collecting from the Lake Superior region. And this is an artifact that's been transformed into a work of art, but then it's been buried into a mound, in a mound for 2,000 years, so it's got this layer of corrosion on it, so it no longer looks copper. When it was new, it would have looked that shiny and that coppery. Who, who made this piece of art? This is a, a piece of art created by the Hopewell culture that lived in Ohio between about AD 1 all the way up to about AD 400. And was that the prevalent culture here at the time? Yeah, it was the predominant culture during that period. There were other cultures, the Adena culture that came before the Hopewell persisted in some areas, particularly in southeastern Ohio. But the Hopewell culture was the predominant culture in central and southern Ohio. Is this essentially a work of art or did it have another purpose? It's a work of art, I think, by anybody's definition, but it would have had a ceremonial purpose. It's probably a piece of regalia. This is a head plate. It was probably part of a headdress that was worn during uh, the ceremonies that took place at these huge Hopewell earthwork centers. There's a, there's a pattern in it. What, does, what do we think this is? Well, this pattern is some kind of carnivore's paw, probably a wolf claw. Some people think it might be a representation of a bear claw, but whatever, it, it represents some kind of carnivore's hand. Um, and that must have had a powerful symbolic significance for the people that created this. The mounds we see as we travel around Ohio, are these the people who built those mounds? Many of them. Many of the biggest ones were built by the Hopewell culture, but we also have many Adena mounds, like the Miamisburg Mound, for example, built hundreds of years before the Hopewell culture. So Adena and Hopewell coexisted? Yeah, the Adena come first, and I believe that the Hopewell come out of the Adena. They, they, they have the Adena roots, but they made changes in their culture and their social systems. And in some cases, Adena people didn't adopt those newfangled ideas retain their conservative ways of life and, and so they do coexist for a certain period of time. This may have belonged to somebody who had some power or prestige in this culture, is that right? Absolutely. The raw material would have been rare. Um, the symbology would have been, uh, had a special significance. We don't know exactly what that would have been. But yes, the person that wore this was probably like a priest, a minister, someone with religious authority. Um, or someone with political authority, but not quite the way we think of kings or emperors or pharaohs. They had a very egalitarian ethic, and all the people that are buried, even the people that were wearing regalia like this, worked as much as everybody else, ate the same foods everybody else was eating, lived in the same kinds of houses. They weren't like chiefs or kings. And that's really one of the mysteries of the Hopewell culture, is how without that kind of political hierarchy, they were able to do the kinds of things they did, building monumental architecture. Maybe we've got some things to learn from them. We absolutely have things to learn from them. How did you come in, or how did the OHC come into possession of this? This was excavated from the Hopewell Mound Group in Chillicothe by former curators of the Ohio History Connection, archeologists that did research around the state. And uh, so this was excavated by our staff. And is this uh, available for view uh, at, when people come and visit OHC? Yeah, this head plate is normally on display here as part of the Following in Ancient Footsteps exhibit. Terrific. Thanks for sharing it with us. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. And remember, you can catch all our episodes on ColumbusNeighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WSU mobile app. And you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. So we'll sail on, sail on down the line. Pack up all your worries, leave them far behind. All you need to bring along, all your plans and schemes, then we'll sail away on our ship of dreams. Our ship of dreams. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by 
At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarter city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance. And for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation, smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. CODA keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Wartime Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State. Changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you.